You guys ready for the show today? Justin Timberlake, right? Yeah, there may there may be some football before or after, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. I'm actually more looking forward uh, to uh, the This Is Us episode that's going to air after the Super Bowl. Anybody else get sucked into that emotional vortex? Very, very emotionally manipulative show. You know that, that Jack dies today, right? You guys didn't see this coming? Can the kids hear me downstairs? Do you know? Okay, good. Because my son's name is Jack, and I didn't want to be like... It'd be bad. All right. Let's get started. Matthew 22, if you turn there with me. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verses 34 through 40. Um, uh, my name is Justin, um, and uh, I get to uh, I get to be the relief pitcher from time to time. Um, and uh, Trevor had a, a week's vacation, so that's why I'm speaking this morning. Um, and uh, I also get to lead community groups. So uh, if you are not in a community group, and maybe you're checking out Oasis, and you're, you're trying to figure out who we really are, um, join a community group. Um, you'll really get a feel for for the pulse of of, of this church, and and I, I would say that the best way to get involved is get in the pastor's community group. the The pastor actually hosts one in his house starting this Thursday night at six thirty p.m. If you really want to find out what, what makes us tick and what we're really really like, get in the pastor's group. Okay, so um, you can talk to me after the service or go to oasisalem.com. dot com. Click on connect. You can read through what our, our community groups are, are like. You can see what the groups are out there. One of them, the, the Monday Night Ireland group, it, it, it's really, really full. We could get you in that group, but it would take a crowbar. Um, and so maybe sign up for another one. All right. So, um, but if you have any questions about that, please let me know and, and I'd love to talk to you about that. So, Matthew chapter 22, um, 34 through 40. Um, you know, uh, the. the this 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 uh, message this morning it kind of originated actually out of a community group time that we had um, a couple of months back. Um, someone in our community group raised the question about prayer, um, something along the lines of well, what should we pray or how should we pray. And and through the the course of that discussion, we 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 talked a lot about uh, specifically petitionary prayer. Petitionary prayer is where where we go to God and we're asking God to do something for us. We go to and we're asking Him for something and. And so but we talked about, you know, does God hear our prayers? Does God answer our prayers? If he does, you know, how he might answer our prayers. Um, can we change God's mind about things? And, and you got to understand that when you're sitting in, in, in a group of, with a group of people and, and you're with people who have gone to God and asked big things, life and death sort of things, and God hasn't given them what they asked for, that, that, that it's a big deal. Like, it's a weighty thing. When we talk about the, the big things, about who God is and what God has done, it, it, it is very, it, well, it's weighty. You know what I mean? And so, the course of that night, there, a couple things came out. One is that we didn't actually all see eye to eye, which was okay. Because the other thing that came out of that time was that, despite the fact that we didn't see eye to eye, we were still a family. We were still a community. And I think that that shows a mark of, of, of spiritual growth. I think it's a, it shows a mark of, of you know, of, of genuine relationship. If you can disagree with somebody and still love them, that, that's real relationship, right? And so, um, since that night, I've been, I've been thinking about it because that was one, actually one of my favorite nights with our community group. Because what I saw in those moments is that there was this people that was gathered together and they were willing to dive into the deep things of who God is to really know God for who he says he is, and, and for not for who we would want him to be. And, and so uh, this morning what I, what I want to do is I want to lay out some principles about what it looks like to know God for who he is. right? To, to, to pursue God for who he actually is and, and not for who we would make him out to be. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to lay about three principles down about, about how we go about doing that, how we engage with God. But before we get there, I, I want to talk about one, one thing that, that, that's crucial to this whole thing, and it's desire. You, you can't have a relationship with God if you don't want a relationship with God. That it begins with a desire within you to know Him. All right? So uh, Matthew chapter 22, I told you guys to turn there like 10 minutes ago. Uh, 22, that's the wrong one. Beginning of verse 
34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. With that, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, uh, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the fact that uh, you actually want us to know who you are. That you want a relationship with us. That you love us so much. That you have revealed to us who you are. And so this morning, I pray that you would do that once again. I pray that you would speak. I pray that the words that people hear this morning are not mine, but that they're yours, because yours are the only words that change people's lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, just to sort of set this up a little bit, these Pharisees are very smart religious people. And they come to Jesus to, to pose a question to him because they want to test him because they want to trip him up. And, and these really, really smart religious people, they, they knew God's word really, really well. Okay, so they had what we would call the Old Testament. They would call it the books of the law and the prophets. And they actually knew those books really, really well. So well, in fact, that many of them had large portions of them memorized. They knew them inside and out. They prided themselves on the fact that they knew what Scripture had to say about God. They thought that they knew who God was. Now, the problem with that is that all of, all of that Scripture, all of the, the, the Old Testament prophets and, and, and all of the law, it actually pointed toward Jesus. It toward the, pointed towards this, this coming king, this, this one that would save it was about Jesus. And, and so when God actually comes and he's there standing right in front of them, they miss him. See, they pridefully thought that they knew who God was. But when he came, they actually didn't want him the way he was. They wanted something else. And so they didn't see him and they missed him. And they were trying to remove Jesus. They're trying to get him out of the way. And so they're, they're attempting to, to, to sort of put him to the test and, and to see if, if he falls so that well, they can just get rid of him. So they put this test to him, and they ask him the, the question, what is the greatest commandment? What does God want most from us? And Jesus answers by quoting Deut Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And what this, this is really talking about is that we're supposed to love God with everything we have. But the way that it's worded, it really unpacks us as human beings. That we're to love the Lord your God with all of our heart. And, and that doesn't mean the, the physical organ within our chest. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, it means we love God with, with all of, of our physical being that is the seat of our will and our desire. In other words, we want God. We actually want God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Love the Lord your God with all of your, your soul. Jesus is talking about our, our immaterial self. God made each and every one of us in his likeness. God is not a physical being. He imparted something to us which is other than physical, other than material. It is spiritual. It is a soul in which we have. And God is saying, I want you to love me, not with your, just your physical body, but with your soul, with everything that is your person, that is your being. And I want you to love me with your mind. Love the Lord your God with all of your mind. It means your intellect. That we are to seek to know God. We are to want him with everything that we have and want to know him, but know him for who he actually is and not for who we would make him out to be. There was once a, a young man who, he graduated from, from law school, and he got his uh, first job at a, at a law firm in a, in a new state, in a new city, and uh, he didn't have any, any friends or any family. When he moved there, he was, he was quite alone. One night, in order to escape the, the boredom of, of his apartment and the loneliness, he decides to, to go and, and take a walk. 
And as he's, he's walking um, through this, this town, he, he hears the sound of, of music coming down the street. And, and it's jazz. And, and he, he can hear the clarinet and the saxophone and, and a piano. And, 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 and as he gets closer, he can hear the sound of a woman's voice. And and there's something about it that was just so beautiful. It was just so mysterious, and it was just calling to him. And and as he passed the the entrance to this nightclub, he just just stopped in his tracks. And before he knew it, he was inside, sitting down at a table, just listening. And, And she was as beautiful to look at as she was to listen to, and he was enraptured. He was captivated by her, and he just fell in love with her. Well, her, her set ends, and she, she leaves the stage, and he goes over to the bartender, and he asks about her and, 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 and who she is and, and all of that. And, and the bartender said, yeah, well, you know, she's so-and-so, and, and she's here every Friday night. And so the next Friday, he's there, sitting in the same place, once again, captivated by her. And the Friday after that, and the Friday after that, week after week, month after month, and, and, and she begins to notice him too. Same guy sit in the same place every week that she's there. And, and so uh, after one, one night's performance, she gets down from the stage and she walks over to the bartender and she asks about him. Like, is he, is he creepy? Like, is he a barfly? Is he here, he here every, every night? What, what is the story? And the bartender says, well, I, I don't really know, but... I know that whenever you're here, he's, he's here. And whenever you're not able to make it, he, when he finds out, he leaves. He's here for you. And so uh, the woman decides that the, the next time she sees him, she's going to introduce herself. So sure enough, the next Friday, he's there, sitting in the same place. And, and so after the first set, she gets down from the stage and she walks over to him. She introduces herself to him. And she asks if she can sit down. The man, young man looked at her, and, and he smiled, and he said, I'm sorry, no. You see, I, I decided a long time ago that if, that if this should happen, I'd, I'd have to say no. See, if you sit down, then we'll begin to talk. And, and I'll find out about you. And I'll find out about who you are. And, and I'll find out that who you are isn't who I want you to be. You won't be who I, I need you to be. Thank you. I'm sorry. No. And so the woman gets up and she, she walks away feeling rejected that once again another man wants her only for her voice or only for her body or only for what, the, what things she can give to someone but doesn't actually want her. That seems like an absurd story, right? To, to give up the chance at true love in order to hold on to a fantasy. That's what we do with God, though. I have a lot of friends who, who do not yet know Jesus, who are not Christians yet. But of all the, the relationships that I have with people who, who don't know Jesus yet, um, I don't actually, I don't think I know of any atheists. And maybe I run into a circle that's never, not very enlightened or whatever, but I don't think I know any, any atheists, like, like real atheists. Like everybody I know, even though they would say that they don't know Jesus or they don't have a relationship with God or they don't love God, they would say that on some level they believe in, in a God of some form or another. And yet the God that they, they believe in, and, and maybe it feels safe this way, is that they would choose not to investigate it. They would choose rather to not know because maybe ignorance is bliss. But I also know some people who, who would call themselves Christians and who like to come to the club and like to sit in the same spot and they like to hear from God and they like to hear people tell them about him and they like the idea of God and they would say that they even love God. But, but the problem is, is when the God of the universe comes to them, And he offers to sit down with them and show them who he really is. They say no. You see, this isn't just a book. 
This isn't mere history. This isn't good philosophy or good theology. This is revelation. This is the God of the universe coming to you and saying, I have made you in my image. There are many ways in which you are like me, but you're not exactly like me. I'm, I'm higher, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm greater, I'm holier, I'm more righteous than you. And, and in order for you to actually understand me, I have to translate myself into words you can understand. And I have entered into your history and I have interacted with people over the course of, of thousands of years in order for you to understand who I am. This is revelation. This is me communicating to you. This is me talking to you. And yet so many people would say, I would rather hear it from somebody else than from you. I have a good pastor. He knows who you are. I'll get the information secondhand. I've read some great Christian books. They know who you are. I'll take it secondhand. But you see, if you sit down at this table, and if you begin to talk to me, I'm going to find out that you're different than what I want you to be. That you're not who I need you to be. It's like spiritual pornography. See, pornography does this. It takes a human being, and it strips away their humanity. It strips away their dignity. It strips away their personhood, and they are reduced to an object which can then be used for someone else's gratification. So, so pornography is, is its fantasy divorced from reality. It's fantasy divorced from relationship. It's fantasy without intimacy. It's fantasy without love. And for many of us, that's how we like our God. Strip away from the fact that he is a being. That he is a person. And reduce him to an object. Make him an idol. Because a God who is a thing is a thing that I can control and I can use. See, the God of my fantasy will answer the prayers I want answered the way I want them answered. The God of my fantasy will not tell me I'm wrong. The God of my fantasy will not call me a sinner. The God of my fantasy will not tell me that I need to change. Because I make this God in my image. And so what we have is not the real living God. Hebrews 10.31 says this, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To be in the hands of the living God in which he defines you. You don't define him. Jesus says in Matthew Chapter 7, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And on that day I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you never knew me. See, if we want a real relationship with a real God. We have to stop believing in a fantasy about him. And the only way that we're going to know the real God is by engaging with him. Through his revelation. So the, the rest of our time this morning, I want to talk about some basic principles. How do we engage with the living God? How do we seek to know him for who he really is and not for who we would make him out to be? And, and the first one is, is this. Know the essentials. Know the essentials about God. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says this. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Paul here makes an outrageous claim that basically says there's one way. There is just one way. 
Now, I know that, that there may be some of you who are joining us today who would say, I'm, I'm not a Christian. I have questions. Um, I, I'm here to sort of check this thing out. I want to I wanna know firsthand what it is that you believe. I'm not a Christian, but I have questions. And I want to say, man, I'm really glad you're here. So glad you're here. And, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to continue to come and interact with us. Don't, don't feel obligated towards anything. When, when the offering plate goes by, pass it by. Like, don't, don't volunteer for anything. Show up and take from us, really. I didn't mean that literally with the offering basket stuff. So just <laughs> stick to the script. But, but, but come and find out who, who we are. Join a community group. Honestly, like, I, I know you think we're hypocrites. Come and, come and join a community group and find out. See it firsthand. Find out if we love one another as much as we say we do. If we treat one another the way that we say that we do. Find out if we're for real. Join a community group. Come and ask questions. Glad you're here. But, but I also, I believe that you're probably coming in with some notions maybe about who we are. You see, for, for me to stand up here and say that there's only one hope and there's only one faith and there's only one God. Coming from the culture outside of these walls, that's going to feel pretty closed-minded to you. Right? Like, in, in, our, in our culture, the, the idea of there being only one way to God is, is really just deplorable. How closed-minded, right? And, and, and I have to admit, like, the universalist idea that, that all paths lead to God like everybody's right and nobody's wrong, there's nothing but heaven and, and nobody goes to hell, that seems like a really beautiful idea. I admit that. But, but the problem with that is if, if everybody's right and nobody's wrong, then there's no judgment. See, if there's no judgment, there's no justice. See, for all the victims of all the abuse for all the people who have had their humanity stripped away from them and they've been reduced to objects to be used and abused at the hands of other people throughout history, there is no justice for them. And so we need judgment, but we need a righteous judge. And we believe that we have that in Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you would say, I'm not a Christian, man, I'm glad that you're here. I want to be honest with you and upfront with you and say, man, we are uniquely Christian, and we want you here. But you need to know that our highest goal and our highest hope for you is that you would know Jesus and you would know God for who he actually is and not for who you want him to be. Paul says we need to know the essentials, and, and here's why he says that. Um, Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. I'm sorry. I skipped ahead. No. That's it, right. So we may no longer be children. Why should we know the essentials about what we believe? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. The, the reason why we need to know the essentials of what we believe is so that we're not tossed to and fro. By, the, by every wind of doctrine that comes along. Let's have a little fun. How many of you um, have not grown up in the Church of the Nazarene, but you grew up in another denomination? Okay, look around. Okay, okay keep your hands up. All right. All right. Now, if I were to bring out a systematic, a systematic theology book and we start going through questions, you know what we'd find? Some disagreements. Right? You know what else we'd find? Agreement. You, you see, the, there are things uh, about the essentials that make us uniquely Christian. There are some secondary issues that we may not agree on, but the primary ones are the ones that hold us together, that make us uniquely Christian and not Muslim, uniquely Christian and not universalists, uniquely Christian and not Jehovah's Witnesses. Uniquely Christian. And you need to know what those are so that you don't get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes along. 
Melissa and I have been married for almost 13 years now, and, and I would say that I know my wife pretty well now. I'm maybe like 85% there. I know her pretty well, but, but I would say going back 13 years to when we first got married, I didn't know her as well as I know her now, but I knew the essentials, and I loved her. She almost knew all the essentials about me. I had her fooled. <laughs> so I was going to get her to marry me. Anyway, um, see, at the, at the beginning of the relationship, it is, it is important that you need to know the essentials about a person before you commit to them. You need to know the essentials about who God is. One faith, one hope, one God, one baptism. You need to know. And our church fathers understood this principle very well. That's why they came up with creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, things to help Christians understand and articulate what the essentials are. In our community group last semester, we spent the whole time talking about um, having an answer for the hope that we have. Being able to articulate the gospel, who God is and what God has done through creation, fall, redemption, restoration, that somebody asks you about the hope you have, you're able to give an answer. But, but more importantly than that, or just as important in that, is that we need to know what we believe so we don't get blown around by every wind of doctrine that comes along. There's a mini-series on right now called Waco. Have you caught that at all? It, it is about um, the FBI... Um, and, and what happened with uh, the Branch Davidian in, in Waco, Texas, under uh, David Koresh, like that, that long drawn out thing that ended in the death of 80 people. The Branch Davidians were a cult of a cult of a cult of a cult off of Seventh day Adventists, a Christian denomination. So, what happens is, 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 is people who, who, who don't really know what it is that they believe are told a lie about what they should believe, and they believe it over and over and over again. And so, lo and behold, you're surrounded by the FBI, and you're not going to make it. Like, I want you to see, the essentials are what matters. You have to know the essentials because, you know, I'm not saying that if you don't know the essentials, you're going to wind up wearing a funky bathrobe, drinking weird Kool-Aid, and giving all your money to some whack job. Could happen. But what I'm saying is this, your fantasy of what God is like will not save you. Your fantasy may be fun and comfortable, it will not save your life. Know the essentials. Second principle. I'll spend the most of the time on this one. Know that you have a big God. Know that you have a really big God. The, the, the song that the, the worship band sang, Where Were You? That, that's taken from uh, Job 38 through 42. And I'm going to read some of those verses to you. It's a really long section of scripture. But I would encourage you, if you're ever feeling like awesome, like really big for your britches one day, go to the coast, read Job 38, 42. And just look at the ocean. Come back humbled. It'll be fine. But, but this is what happens. In Job 38, uh, the, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You see, uh, Job was this guy who believed in God, and he was a pretty righteous man, but God put Job through a really bad time. Horrible. Horrible. And so Job is questioning God. He's questioning God's goodness. He's questioning God's greatness. He is just, he's mad at God. And God shows up. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? He goes on, Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are. God shows up. And, and at the end of this, at the beginning of chapter 42, Job speaks again. 
And listen to what Job says. He says, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God shows up. And, and, and Job went from thinking he had an idea about who God was. That a righteous God would not do this to me. And God shows up and he is humbled. And he is changed by that encounter with God. See, God is bigger than you think he is. He, he is more powerful than you think he is. He is more gracious than you think he is. When, when you begin to interact with God and he begins to reveal himself and you begin to look at his story, what you see is over and over and over again, man rebels, God pursues. Man sins, God righteousness overtakes. Over and over and over again, John 1.16 says, grace upon grace. God is more gracious than you can possibly know. You cannot out -sin him. He's bigger than you think he is. He's bigger. He's greater. In Matthew 19, there's a rich young guy, and he comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus what he needs to do in order to, to receive eternal life. And, and Jesus says to him, he lists off a bunch of commandments, and, and, and the guy says, well, I've done all that. And Jesus says, all right. Go and sell everything you have, give your money to the poor, and come and follow me. And, and the man says, uh, no thanks. And, and he walks away very, very sad. Right? And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says this. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when I was a young man, I heard a preacher preach on this. And, and, and he said, that in ancient fortified cities, they would have these things called eyes of needles, and there would be these small gates in, in the, the city wall, and they're just big enough for a person to walk through. And for a camel to get through them, if a camel got on its knees and crawled through, then it could make it through. And so what Jesus is saying here is, you, if you're humble, you can make it into heaven. And when I heard that, I'm like, well, that's really clever. That's really smart. I mean, this guy's got some knowledge of ancient civilizations, and, and that's really important. That's really neat. And then years later, I was actually studying this chapter. And that guy was really wrong. No, what Jesus meant was an actual camel going through an actual needle. It's impossible. And what Jesus is, the point that he's making is that it doesn't matter how humble you are. Just so you know, humble is a good thing. God wants that. Humble is a good thing. But you being humble doesn't earn salvation. The only way that a rich man or a rich woman or any man or any woman, for that matter, gets it into the kingdom, into the kingdom of heaven is by God's grace. And see, I bring that story up because somewhere along the line, there's going to be somebody like me talking to you about, uh, about something that happens in Scripture, about something that God has done or something that, that God has said, and, and they're, going to give you, they're going to give you another or an alternative viewpoint a different picture of, of, of what, what went down. And, and you're going to wonder, which is the right one? How, how do I discern which one is right and which one is wrong? And so here's a clue. If in somebody's explanation of something, if, if man is somehow elevated, man is somehow better or wiser or smarter or more clever, if man is somehow lifted up and God is somehow demeaned, that's the wrong one. But if in that explanation, God is lifted up, and God is greater, and God is more glorious, and, and God is more righteous, and God is more... That's the right one. Because let's be honest, if we're going to err when it comes to God, if we're going to make a mistake about who God is, let's err on the side of big God. I mean, I don't want to get to heaven and get that slap on the back of the head and God saying, you didn't think I could do that? Like, err on the side of big God. You're going to have people who want to give you alternative explanations for 
how the, the crossing of the Red Sea happened in Exodus, or, or how a virgin could give birth, or how a man could walk on water, or how the dead could be raised. And, and, and they're going to try to convince you of, of an alternative way of looking at that that makes man look really cool and God looking less. And just think about this for a minute. If God can create DNA, the building blocks of all of life, and program it and do all that sort of stuff with it so that we have a planet and a solar system and a galaxy and a universe. If God can do that, you don't think he can stack up a little water, make a virgin give birth, or raise a man from the dead? See, one of those essentials is that God does miracles. God does miracles. He's greater than you. He's more powerful than you. He is a big, big God. And he's more righteous Paul writes this in Romans 9. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion so that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. And you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? See, when you begin to engage God in this, you're going to find out things firsthand from him about what he's done or what he said, and you're not going to like some of them. When you read what God does to Job, you're not going to like that. And so you're going to be tempted to say, I couldn't believe in a God who would do that. I'll fill in the blank. I'll I'll, I'll make him do something else. I'll believe... I'll believe a fantasy about him instead. You see, what you do when when you do that is you take a very, very big and righteous God and you try to just put him into your little tiny moral box. And God is more righteous than you. And he's more righteous than me. God is the definition of righteousness. He is righteousness. Believe in a big God. Believe that he is more glorious than you can imagine. Last week, Andrea read from Revelation chapter 4, in, in which there's, there's pictured the throne room of heaven. And, and, and if you read Revelation 4, you can create these really wonderful images in your mind about what that must be like. And it's a beautiful, worshipful picture. But know that when you actually get to see it, it will be better. It will be more glorious than, than what you could possibly imagine. The last aspect of this is God is is, is more mysterious than you think. You need to be able to be comfortable with mystery. There will be things about God that you will not be able to wrap your mind around. Anybody think about the Trinity? One God. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. Three persons. One God. That doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. And anybody who comes along and says, hey, I can explain that to you, just don't believe them. He is a big God. You are a created being. He is a creator. There will be things about him that we cannot understand. Uh, Paul says this to the Corinthians, the world did not know God through wisdom. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. I love what Matt Chandler says in in, uh, Explicit Gospel. He says, trying to figure out God is like trying to catch fish in the Pacific Ocean with an inch of dental floss. It's a foolish act predicated on a foolish overestimation of human intellect and ability. We have a big God. Third principle, no Jesus. Uh, John, in introducing us to who Jesus is in the first chapter of his gospel, says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is capitalized in your, your, your Bibles because he's talking about Jesus. It's a name for Jesus, the Word, the Logos. He is the communication of God. He is God communicated to us in human form. Jesus is God over and over and over again. Jesus said, if you want to know who God the Father is, look at me. You want to know what he's like? Watch me. You want to know what he sounds like? Listen to my words. If you want to know who God is, know Jesus. The first four books of the New Testament, 
Testament, I'm sorry, are all about him. Mark is the shortest one. Start there. Just read the red parts. The red parts are, are, are the parts, if you have a red letter edition Bible, those are the parts, those are the things that Jesus said. Start with just, just reading what Jesus said. Start there, get to know Jesus. Get to know who he is. I love the Gospel of John. Because every time I read it, I, I find out how, how much bigger he is and how much more beautiful Jesus is. Know who Jesus is. Look, now I know that this is hard. Do you know that, that one of the writers of, of, of this says about another one of the writers, that dude is hard to understand. Peter, talking about Paul. That guy says some stuff that is so over my head at times. Look, this is not easy to understand, but, but you need to, to get that this isn't a textbook. This is revelation. This is God communicating to you, and he means to do it to you firsthand. Through God the Holy Spirit sitting down at the table with you, going through this with you, you're not meant to read this alone. You're not meant to read it without his help. You get that knowledge firsthand from him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Know the essentials of what you believe so you don't get tossed to and fro by winds of doctrinal change, by new neat ideas about who God is. Believe that you have a big God. Embrace what you can about a big God and know Jesus. I'm going to ask for the worship team to come back up. As I try to wrap this up, and in a minute I'm going to pray and I'm going to open up the communion table. But, but as we close, I have just a couple of questions that I want you to consider. The first question I say I would say is probably the second most question that, important question that any human being can answer. It defines who you are. It defines your, your, your motivation. It, it, it defines everything about the way that you live. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? And for some of you, that's a very easy question to answer. And so for some of you, that's a little bit difficult. But the second question I would say is probably the most important. Is he the God of your fantasies or is he the living God? Do you have a God that you've made in your image? Do you have a God that you can handle, that you can manage? Do you have a fantasy about who God is that's divorced from reality? A fantasy that is without relationship, without intimacy, and without love. Is he the God that you've made? Or do you have the living God? Do you have a relationship with the living God who you can't control and who you can't define and who you have to submit to? The thing is, is, is the fantasy, man, that'll make you feel good. But I won't save. It's only the real God that will give you life. And it's the real God, the real relationship, that is better. So much better. Any of you know somebody who turned out not to be who you thought they were, but they were better. God is so much better. So much bigger. Like if you're here today and and you would say, I I have been living in a fantasy about who God is. I I, I believe in a God that I made. I love a God that that, that I, I made to suit me. But I want the real thing. I want him for who he really, really is. After the service, I'll be up here. 
If you don't want to talk to me here, if this is a little bit intimidating for you, my name is Justin Morris. Hit me up on Facebook. Send me a message. We'll get coffee. The real God saves. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, how awesome you are. How great you are. How powerful you are. And yet you humble yourself in order for us to know you. You come to us because we can't come to you. You communicate to us in our language because we can't communicate to you in yours. You sent us, Jesus, to show us who you are in order to pay the penalty for our sin. The sin of, of believing in fantasies. Of turning to lies about who you are and what you've done. And he comes and he willingly takes the price for that. In his flesh, on that cross. But your story doesn't end there because you raised him from the dead and through him conquering death, we can conquer death through too. And through him, we can be reconciled to you. To have have an eternity where we get to know you face to face for who you actually are. And we believe that you are so much better, so much bigger, so much more powerful than we could possibly imagine. We love you, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As you come for communion this morning, my hope for you is that this this would not be about tradition or that this would not be about doing something because you do it. That as you come to to partake of, of, of this body that's been broken for you, of this symbol of the blood that's been shed for you, that as you reach out your hands for this, this would be an act of desire for you that you would want Jesus as much as he wants you.